I'm Dan Miller. I'm Kevin Stern. At Miller Stern Lawyers, we are honored to serve the community that we love. We work for you. For over a decade, we've spent our days and nights fighting for you. We believe in justice. We believe in fighting for what's right. That's why we are proud to sponsor a community conversation to make a better Baltimore. It takes guts to stand up for justice and accountability and demand better. And we can do it by giving you a voice in your future. At Miller Stern, we're fighting for a better Baltimore. Baltimore, Charm City, neighborhoods full of history, great people, and lots of potential. A city trying to clean up its act after years of decay. A place where children should be safe to play on clean streets. But the pockets of problems are growing. Grime and crime make for bad neighbors. And now, even the once pristine parts of our wonderful city are in the fight of their lives. To stop a city plagued by crime, grime, corruption, and failing schools. From Fox 45 News, this is a Your Voice, Your Future Town Hall. The Save Our City Tour. Neighbors helping neighbors, council district by council district. Good evening and welcome to Huber Memorial Church, one of the crown jewels of City Council District 4 right here in Baltimore City. Tonight, the fifth installment of Fox 45 Save Our City Town Hall Tour, where we go to each council district in Baltimore City and give you, the public, an opportunity to voice your concerns. Tonight, we invited several elected leaders to this discussion, including both Mayor Brandon Scott and District 4 Councilman Mark Conway, but they both refused to attend. We also invited City School CEO Sonia Santalisis and the entire school board. They, too, have refused to face the public. Now, normally we would only focus on issues plaguing this specific city council district, but tonight is an exception because over the past week, Baltimore City Schools has taken center stage and not in a good way. Last week, the mayor deflected blame over the lack of air conditioning in more than 20 city school buildings, even though the city has received millions of dollars in state funding to address the issue. Also last week, an explosive internal report into Augusta Fell Savage Institute of, the Visual, of Visual Arts confirming what Fox 45's Project Baltimore has been reporting for months, that school employees were changing grades and over-reporting the number of enrolled students. Tonight, our main focus is education. While many are calling for City School CEO to step down after the damning report confirming those serious allegations, again, of grade changing and inflating enrollment at the West Baltimore High School. Allegations first exposed by Fox 45 News. But first, after this two-year internal investigation, City Schools released its report. Augusta Fell Savage, detailing a scheme to change grades and pad the roles with students who were not actually attending the school. Now, Project Baltimore's Chris Paps exposed these allegations more than six months ago, and now we're learning the problem was even bigger than we knew. It's a report that set off a firestorm. The ghost students were attending ghost classes. The classes didn't exist. Serious allegations of grade changing and inflating enrollment at a West Baltimore high school, first exposed by Project Baltimore earlier this year, and now confirmed by City School's own investigator. We also had grade fixing, grade changing yep. scandals in Baltimore City before. Yes, we did. And that we were Project told, Baltimore uncovered. We, we were told, well, we, we fixed that. And yep. they, here we've got Augusta Fells. After a two-year internal investigation, city schools found administrators at Augusta Fells Savage improperly changed grades and pressured teachers to give students grades they did not earn. He didn't fail, the school failed him. Project Baltimore first discovered grading irregularities at Augusta Fells in March six months ago when we spoke with Tiffany France. Her son passed just three classes in four years, but was still being promoted through the course levels. With a .13 GPA, he ranked 62nd out of 120 in his class. Where do I turn? Where do I go? Who helps? My son, what, what happens for me? The second major finding from the report, students were scheduled in classes that did not exist and or that they did not attend when they should have been withdrawn due to a lack of attendance. From August up until December, 
So from August to December of 2019, you were incarcerated? Yes. Project Baltimore in April spoke to this student who says he may have been enrolled, but he wasn't in school because he was in jail. His name appeared on a list of 21 seniors enrolled, but not attending. Ghost students, as they're known by educators, can be used to inflate enrollment numbers and increase the tax dollars a school receives. And it turns out the problem is even bigger than we first reported. City schools identified 100 students with questionable status. Somebody has to be accountable for that. Somebody has to put the checks and balances in place. When all GO students are accounted for, it could be millions of dollars owed to taxpayers. And the question remains, were any laws broken? And will anyone face criminal charges? So if the only thing that we have left is bringing people into a courtroom in handcuffs, you know, to answer for their actions, that's, you know, if the evidence dictates it, that's certainly something that would be appropriate. Now let's bring in Chris. Chris, let's talk about some of those ghost students. We saw that you spoke with a student who was in jail but was still enrolled at Augusta Fell. And in fact, he wasn't the only one. You had found others who hadn't been in school. Yeah, some of them for years. Now, we had a list of 21 seniors who were enrolled on paper but not actually going to the school. Now we've learned it could be closer to 100 ghost students just at this one school. And at nearly $16,000 per student, that adds up to nearly $2 million that you, the taxpayer, sent to the school to educate students who were not there. Chris, some are calling for the criminal investigation of this. We heard Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford say it yesterday. Today, Governor Larry Hogan said that what he saw seemed to be criminal from his opinion. Do we know if any laws have been broken? Well, that is something that we're going to have to be looking at like in the coming weeks, in the coming months. And this is something that we're still trying to answer. Now, we did speak to a Baltimore-based attorney who did tell us that if charges are filed, they most likely are going to come from the state's attorney general's office, though federal charges could also be possible, Mackenzie, because there are federal, state, and city dollars that go to this school. If charges are filed, they would likely be for falsifying financial records or perjury, because if school administrators signed fraudulent enrollment paperwork, for example, under penalty of perjury, and they knew those numbers were not right, that could be a criminal charge. All right, Chris, thank you so much. Now we've assembled some top city activists to address the concerns in the 4th Council District. We're in code red for Baltimore City Schools. And tonight, our panel will hash it all out and look for solutions, starting with Bob Wallace. He is a business owner, former mayoral candidate, and a graduate of the Baltimore City School System. Thank you. Pastor Shannon Wright, former mayoral candidate as well, and the leader of Urban Engagement Initiative, a group that is threatening to sue Baltimore City Schools if the CEO does not step down or resign or is removed from her position. Theru Vignaraja, a former Baltimore City mayoral candidate and product of the city school system. He's a former federal prosecutor and deputy attorney general of Maryland who says fixing the problems in Baltimore City starts with education. Giovanni Patterson, a former candidate for city council president, who is putting pressure on the city council's education committee to hold the school board accountable for the failures in the school system. Panelists, again, thank you. Welcome. We are excited to have you here tonight with us. Let's dive right in and start with some of our questions and our topics. Mr. Wallace, Fox 45's Project Baltimore was first to report these allegations of grade changing and ghost students at Augusta Fells. Now, an internal investigation, as we have heard, verified some of those findings in Project Board's Project Baltimore's reporting, but Mayor Scott has accused us at Fox 45 of using this story for clickbait. Why won't the mayor just concede that Project Baltimore was correct in its reporting and put pressure on the school system to do better in the future? Well, I think one thing that all leaders have to do right, is to take ownership, is to take ownership of, of whatever you are responsible for. So, that, so as mayor of the city, even though there are constraints about what he or she can do, they have to own the educational process. I totally agree that if we don't fix the education problem in Baltimore City, all the other issues that we're facing are not gonna go away. The crime, the violence, the hopelessness, and helplessness. So education becomes key, but the mayor has to be 
the main one who owns the education of our babies. And that's where I think we fall short. Thank you, Pastor Wright. I wanted to ask you a question. Do you think what happened at Augusta Fells is happening or could be happening at other schools across the district? Of course it could. I is mean, it? it? Things don't happen in a vacuum. Right. If this is a policy, if we had a principal at Augusta Fells that was at a school prior to that where there were investigations and multiple investigations, there's no reason to believe that this was just a one-off. It appears as if this is an ongoing pattern in Baltimore City Public Schools. And if this is an ongoing problem, we just heard the lieutenant governor yesterday say on WBAL Radio, C4 and Brian Neiman show, we heard the governor say today that there should be possibility of a criminal investigation launched. Mr. Vignaraj, I want to direct this question to you. Do you think that they're right? Should there be an investigation launched at the state level into this? Look, there certainly needs to be an investigation. I mean, raise your hand if you were surprised to learn that there was forged grades, fabricated things. Is anybody surprised by that? I mean, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be surprised for two reasons. First, because, frankly, your station has been reporting this for months, even as the city has been silent and stonewalling. This has been the subject of public coverage for months. And frankly, it's not surprising because it's been going on for years. And if something has been going on for years, under the nose of the mayor, under the nose of the city council, who, by the way, approve the $295 million that we sent to the city schools every year, then it's not just that it's their responsibility to see that it's gets corrected. It's also their responsibility to be held accountable for allowing it to happen. Right. A quick follow-up to that. We see people who embellish and lie all the time to make more money. Is it commonplace in some industries like insurance and healthcare? What's the difference between what we're seeing, the run of the mill, and what's happening at Augusta Fells? You know, if a doctor forged papers about patients to get more Medicaid claims, more money from the government by saying, oh, this patient is one of my patients, this patient needs an extra procedure. If they were making that up, they would be, in fact, they have been prosecuted for Medicaid fraud. Absolutely. This isn't that different. Now, the person might say, well, I wasn't doing it to put the money in my own pocket. It was for the children. We have one of the highest per pupil expenditures in the country. It's not a very good defense to say I was stealing money from the taxpayers to give it to someone else. That doesn't fly. Mr. Patterson, I want to direct this question to you. We've seen members of the city council come forward and talk about issues that are important to them, whatever that may be, various topics. But when I've asked them and uh, several of my colleagues have asked them about this specific issue, the silence is deafening. We haven't heard mum from city council members. Why do you think that is when it comes to this topic or education in general? Quite frankly, they don't care. Um, and I think that's really the simple answer for that. Uh, we'll see a city council that will... Uh, petition the President of the United States to end a trade embargo in Cuba, but not address the, uh, the, the failing education right here in Baltimore City. So that shows where their priorities are, and they're clearly not for our children. And, and it shows where the priorities are for the in, entire school system, right? Those administrators, it's not to educate our kids, it's really to line their own pockets uh, to, to, you know, uh, uh, administrators making $100,000 or more, um, money just getting stuck in the um, North Avenue building. It's not for the kids. The money should be following the kids. Our education system, be, sh system should be held accountable, and the power needs to be returned back to the people. Do you think that the members of city council, should they be using their platform to speak out about this? Absolutely. But the, the main thing is that they should be listening to the people. I understand people don't like uh, Fox 45 or, or, or what have you, but th it's, this is a, a, a panel of citizens. This, is, uh, this church is filled with community members, people who voted for these people to be in office. These are the people that should be heard right now. And they're here trying to uh, express their voices for their voices to be heard. And Fox 45 right now is giving them the microphone and they're not listening. So it really shows where their priorities lie. McKinsey, if I could just add, I think it's actually even worse than Giovanni is saying. This is the fifth town hall that has been hosted all across the city. Not a single city council person, not a single uh, uh, mayor or council president has shown up to any of them. That's not an accident. That's not a mistake. That's not because they had a conflict. The mayor skipped a town hall because he was playing flag football 10 minutes away. I mean, they're making a crass, calculated political choice. They're hoping that you guys won't pay attention to the fact that they don't show up, because if they do show up, they're not afraid of us. 
They're afraid of you. They're afraid of having to answer questions from the public about why we had 2,000 murders in the last seven years, why 40% of our kids have a 1.0 GPA, that's a D GPA or worse, why 21 schools don't have air conditioning. They're not afraid of us. They're not afraid of Fox 45. They're afraid of the people. And they're hoping that you won't remember in a couple of years when election time comes up that they never showed up to a single one of these forums. That's what they're hoping for. And the power is in your hands to show them that they're wrong. But I, would, but I would add, forget the mayor, forget city council. What about us? How long has this been happening in our city? And what has been our response? We need to be out in front of these folks, right? Holding them accountable, letting them hear and feel our anger about this. It's up to us. So what we can't you? wait for these folks to lead us into the promised land. We have to take ourselves into the promised land. Mr. Wallace, what does that look like? What is that, you say outrage, what does that look like from a community level? What do you think it would take to get the elected leader's attention from the community level? I think a couple of things. I think number one is be clear with these politicians that we're gonna hold them accountable and that we have metrics that we're gonna measure them and how they perform. And that we are willing to get in their face come down to, to, to headquarters, go to the schools to let them know we're not going to take this anymore. Enough is enough. We've had leaders for decades. This issue is not new. So we have to stand up, folks, and take charge of this. Speaking of air conditioning, Kessaray, 13 percent of city schools, they don't have air conditioning. We asked the mayor about this, and he won't put any fault on the school board, even though the school board, per the city charter, does have the ability to maintain and repair city buildings. Why does the mayor seem to be carrying the water for the school board? I'm a businessman, and I, and I have to deal with my board of directors. Whenever, time, whenever a board does not hold its CEO and this organization accountable for performance, that board needs to go and Pastor get a new board that will hold them accountable. Absolutely. Pastor Wright, what do and you think? If I could add to that, you know, the mayor's been saying, well, you know, the state approved the plan to have all of the schools, uh, phys the physical buildings upgraded by the 21-22 school year or next school year. That was pre-COVID. So now you've got children in buildings that aren't up to pre-COVID standards, and you're expecting them to go to these schools. You're expecting parents to willingly say, okay, bye, honey, hope you don't get sick, and send their children off to school where they're not getting educated in the first place and could come home sick and spread it to everybody else. The mayor, Amen. in order for him to continue to do that, means he does not care. So everybody in this room, by the fact that you're here, does. But being in this room isn't enough. Right. So it's what you do outside of this room. How many parents are willing, when you take your children, to spend the extra 15 minutes, actually make an appointment and go in the building? Look in the classrooms. See if there's social distancing. See if your school is one of the ones that hmm, has air conditioning that the Board of Ed is maintaining, and the building is still too hot for the children to be able to breathe comfortably in the masks they're required to wear. My Lord talk about the problems. Let's also talk about the solutions. Pastor Wright is absolutely right. COVID made these schools that don't have proper ventilation systems more dangerous, more deadly to these children, number one. But it also means that we had these schools empty and abandoned for the longest stretch since they have been built. For years, we have said we can't get the kids out to put the air conditioning systems in. These buildings have been open and vacant for 18, 18 months and we haven't improved the situation from where we were last year shame on us for just and that wasn't some rocket science solution people were proposing that people were pitching that they just decided it wasn't their responsibility and shame on us for allowing them to get away with that this was the time and, and for the board of ed to push the reset button this was that time mm -hmm. they were still getting funding in they still had funds to work with instead of you know, working on lining their IRAs, they could have been actually doing something to fix the buildings that these kids were eventually going to come back to. This would have been a time to get your house in order. 
and the city missed the opportunity to do that. HVAC, buildings with windows that don't open, getting some actual curriculum that works, getting the resources to the teachers, making it so that when the children came back in the school, the buildings looked like someplace they wanted to be and could get educated, and there was actually resources in the classroom to educate them and keep them safe. Pastor Ray, we also know that winter will be coming in just a few months, and we'll have, we're dealing with air conditioning now, but we'll also be dealing with schools without heat. Absolutely. In the coming months. So, that, and that's problematic. A couple of years ago, uh, after the Christmas recess, in January, the kids came back to school. It had snowed. Mm-hmm. There was a big deal about schools had to be closed for a couple of days. Well, did you not know it was January? Did you not know? Did the buildings have heat before Christmas and it left? These things are things that any good leadership actually plans for. I was so disappointed when, when Mayor Scott said, well, you know, I've been here and when I went to school, none of the buildings had heat and, and had air. How many have watched those old timey movies where the folks have said, where there's an old guy sitting on a porch that said, well, when I went to school, we didn't have buses. I didn't even have shoes. So what? That was then. This is now. Mayor Scott is an expert on the problems without a clue to a solution. And everybody in this room is paying for it. Everybody in the city is paying for it. Mr. Patterson, I want to ask you this question. Should Mayor Scott be putting more pressure on the school board and the CEO to take action or to make changes when it, were, when it comes to these problems that we're seeing at Augusta Fells and perhaps other schools? I'll go back to what I said. I'm sorry, Tony. Go, go ahead. Is that me? Yes. Oh. Um, Should they be putting more pressure? Absolutely. Um, I mean, we see them put pressure on on anything else, right? We see them uh, protest or advocate for statues to be removed. Um, You know, things that are not relevant to the future of our our city, right? Um, So there absolutely should be pressure. And there's positions within our city charter to make that happen. So again, it, it shows to where, where the priorities lie. Um, everyone should have the, the handout of uh, the, the Baltimore Municipal Org Chart. And I, I just want to remind everybody of where your position is in this I- entire process, which is at the top. So we have to go back and remember our position, remember that we have the power to hold the, these elected officials uh, 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 accountable. And then when we remember that, uh, you know, they're automatically going to do our, their jobs, right? We pay them. We pay them. And they're, if they can ignore that, um, it, it, they get the run amok. So let's, let's go back and return to our position, our rightful place as the people that control and run the city. Do you think that the elected leaders have forgotten who put them there? They, they don't care. They, they often they, do. They, just, they don't just care. Just to piggyback on, on what the Roo <laughs> said, uh, in, four, in, in two or three years when, when it's time to, to vote again, they won't remember this, right? And they expect you not to remember. Whose job is it to make sure that they don't forget? It's ours. It's all of us. The, the, we have a civic responsibility, right? And, and if we want the power to return back to where it belongs, we have to own that process. We can't give up our power and say uh, and expect someone to hold that deer and hold that, uh, do the things that we want them to do. We can't give away our responsibility and expect people to do right by it. We have to, when when that power is returned, we have to remember we have that responsibility. And this, this, I'm glad we're having these town halls because a lot of people are now waking up and remembering that we are the ones that run this city. We, We also can't allow our city politicians to mislead us and trick us. Right. How many of you have heard the mayor, the council president say that the schools are not the city's responsibility? How many of you have heard him say, right. it's a state agency, Clap it's not my responsibility? Well, here's the truth. The people that hold the power over the schools are the people that control the budget, the people that pick, appoint, and have the power to fire the CEO of schools, and the people that can hold hearings. You know who does that? It's not the governor. It's not the comptroller. It's the mayor of Baltimore. That's right. We send $295 million to the school system. That $1.2 billion budget has to be approved by the school board, but it also has to be approved by the council and the mayor. If they don't approve that budget, they don't get a dollar. 
All nine uh, uh, school board commissioners are appointed not by the governor, but by the mayor. The school board selects the CEO, has the power to fire the CEO, and we can also have hearings. There is literally no thing that the mayor can't do to regulate and control the, the, the schools. He just decides to choose to play like a game of hot potato. Whenever we hear about the crisis of schools, he says, not my fault, not my responsibility, and we allow him to operate under the fiction that because it's a state agency, he doesn't have the power. I promise you, the mayor and the council have all the power that they need. They just choose to do nothing. While we're on this topic, I want to go up and down the panel really quickly. Yes or no answer. Do you think that the CEO, Dr. Santelise, should be forced to answer for this investigation at Augusta Falls, and should she resign? Mr. Wallace. She owns it. She should answer to it. And if she cannot come with, a, if she cannot come up with a reasonable response, she should be fired. Pastor Wright. She owns it, and either way, she should be fired because I either she knew about it or she was asleep at the wheel. And either way, she needs to go. Mr. Vignaraja. I think, she should, uh, I think she should answer these questions. I think she should be here answering your questions. And if she doesn't have a capable answer, I think I agree with Bob that she should be given the opportunity to do it. But if she doesn't take that opportunity, if you've been there for six years and your students and your system is still failing, it's time to go. Time to go. Mr. Patterson. Look, our, our school systems was trending down before she got a raise last year. And uh, I don't know one CEO uh, you know, if it was Nike, if it was Reebok, that would still be in the position in that job uh, if, if their biz business was going down. Yep. So, yes. Thank you. I want to bring back Chris Paps with Project Baltimore again. Chris, the school system says that it flagged problems at Augusta Falls back in 2019 and removed the leadership. But Project Baltimore has reported on some serious failures across the board and that this is not an isolated incident. Yeah, it's certainly not an isolated incident. In fact, the principal that was brought in to fix the problems at Augusta Falls, her name is Kamala Carnes. Now, she was involved, we found, in two previous internal investigations, one involving the mismanagement of student funds at another school that she was at. That was substantiated by city school's own investigator that she did that. And yet a grade-changing investigation at a third school that she was at. And this is all two internal investigations in five years into the principal that is now at Augusta Fell Savage that city schools is telling us is experienced and transformational and is going to fix that school. So these failures, they've been in city schools for a long time, as we've heard throughout the evening tonight. Uh, this is not necessarily new. And in, this has also happened again in 2017, like you mentioned, this is not the new thing. What about performance and student performance? I know that Project Baltimore has been reporting on that significantly. Student performance is not great. Uh, it is the third lowest performing school uh, according to the U.S. Department of Education when they, when they test schools throughout the country. So in 2017, we had found that there were 13 schools in Baltimore City that, 13 high schools in Baltimore City, I should say, that did not have any students proficient in math. There were six total schools that did not have any students proficient in any state testing, math or English. Now, since we have reported that, City Schools has no longer been reporting publicly that data. So we don't know what the numbers are from 2017 to now, because after we started reporting it, they changed the way they give you the data. Now, closer to now, this past year, we have found that 41 percent of all the city high school students in the city earned below a 1.0 GPA in the first three quarters of this past school year. That is below a D. That's a D minus to an F. Also during that time, 57% of all elementary and middle school students are failing one or more classes. These are pretty, these pretty abysmal points here. Now we've also uncovered allegations of grade changing at a number of schools, including Calverton Elementary Middle, where we had obtained two versions of report cards that were before and after those grades had been changed. The principal there fell under an internal investigation. Grade changing was substantiated. And what did they do? City schools put her in a different school. 
similar to Kamala Karns, that was happening at Augusta Fells. Now, teachers told us this problem was widespread, but after we tried to file public records requests with city schools, they denied those records requests. Project Baltimore ended up suing city schools in 2017. We won. A judge sided with us, saying that city schools willfully and knowingly violated the law by not turning over those documents. Chris, the lack of transparency from city schools has been an ongoing issue as well. Yeah, it, this has been going on for the four and a half years at Project Baltimore that we've been doing our thing. There is a culture here of retaliation against people inside city schools. So if they speak out, there is retaliation against them. And that is not us saying that. That is every single person that we speak to in Baltimore City Schools, no matter where they work in that school system, from North Avenue on down. There is, a, there is a culture of this retaliation. But when we won that lawsuit, city schools had to turn over more than 8,000 emails that related to grade changing. And we found what the employees were actually saying in those emails, again, that we had to sue to get. Now, we found that the grades were being rounded up. Teachers were being pressured to, grade, to change these grades. Mm -hmm. Some of them pushed back. Students were being promoted without even showing up to class. The teachers were saying, we don't think that the student deserved this grade to be changed. The grade was changed anyway. All right, Chris, thank you so much for that. The reporting Project Baltimore, we appreciate you for being here. Now we want to hear from you, the citizens and taxpayers of Baltimore, about the issues and ideas for solutions. I'm joined now by my colleague, Riel Creighton, who is here tonight to take questions from the audience. Riel, what are you learning from our audience members and what do they want to ask? Mackenzie, we're getting a lot of questions from people. A lot of them surround accountability with the school district, but we're here with Mark Cannon. He's a well-known activist in the community, a familiar face, but this is also his district. And he had a question that related to, one, also accountability, but also about what he sees happening in the schools regarding health. You think there's a missing health component inside yes. Baltimore City Schools? Yes. Um, even before the covert, you know, it was said that it was 3,200 young people going to school homeless. I had all been talking a long time about having a health, a mental, emotional, physical health with a, a conflict resolution component, wraparound services in there, you know, more counselors and stuff. I had six children go through the Baltimore City School System. I went through there. This is my district. And, and I want to and I want to say for any elected official that's using that, I'm mad at Fox. Um, when 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 um they had the mayoral uh, race and Jack Young um didn't show up to the first one they had at Coppin, Miss Dr. Kathy Hughes sit, called him out by name and said, Jack Young, you need to be at these town halls. He didn't show up to any. He's no longer mayor. But you you had wanted to ask. I know you Absolutely. directed to Rue and maybe even Bob Wallace about yes. forcing officials to show up. How yes. do you get them here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Mr. Faru, you talked about it. You hit on it. Um, you know, every time you, you talk to them, you know, it's some kind of excuse. You hit on the, the crime and you hit on the school. You know, um, they rush children back to school, you know, in spite of COVID and stuff in Garrett County and stuff like that. Me and Ms. Wright and them, we were out uh, in front of the headquarters. We were downtown. There was teachers down there scared to talk because of retaliation. Mr. Wallace, when he ran for mayor, he was out in the communities. He was talking to the commissioner about what he needed, and he wasn't even elected. But yet we have elected officials that all they do is duck the media, which they really duck in us. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe, Mr. Wallace, maybe you can touch on that. Absolutely. One thing that I've been pushing for, it, whether it be a charter change or whatever, is that, is that we have the power and option to recall politicians after we've elected them. So we, ha we, we elect them, they get in office, we get, we get enough data that shows us they are not performing, that we have a, a way to recall them and get them out of there and get the right women and the right men in there to do the job. So I think having a recall option, sir, would be very, very helpful. I know we've talked about that. Yes, we have. <laughs> And a lot of people that I've talked to have, say, have, have offered that idea. So I want to hear from the audience. Clap if you believe that the city should have the ability to recall their elected leaders.
That would get their attention. What? That would get their attention. That would so, get their attention. On the last election, there were a lot of uh, agenda items, a lot of ballot initiatives. One of them, either I or Jay, was establishing that Mr. Co Councilman Conaway, who's not here tonight, chairs a legislative subcommittee who has the power to call an investigation for the removal of sitting elected officials. Now, had he shown up tonight, that would have been a very interesting question to ask him. But, but some step has been taken to kind of incorporate some way to do that. If I can just add one thing, there's a, I really appreciate your, your observation. People oftentimes defend these politicians by saying all of this negative coverage is bad for Baltimore. All you're doing is talking about the problems. And I just want to put this in perspective. If we had in Howard County 2,000 people that were killed, if we had 40% of the students in Howard County having a D average or below, if 21 schools in Howard County didn't have air conditioning, if you couldn't drink water from any of the water fountains in any of the schools in Howard County, CNN and Fox News and the White House would be paying attention to Howard County. But here in Baltimore City, we think it's okay. We think it's no big deal. That is the problem with our city politicians. They have contributed to this culture of low expectations. They think what is unfolding, the tragedy that is unfolding on their watch in our city is just okay. They don't think it even demands them to show up and answer your questions. Look, if I were them, I wouldn't want to defend their record either. It's abysmal. But it's literally their job to come here and fail the hard questions. It's not the ribbon cuttings and the political theater that they get paid for. They get paid to do the hard things, too, and they don't do it. Mr. Pedersen, I want to go back to you for a moment. Where do you think Baltimore City Schools would be right now without Project Baltimore's reporting? Uh, well, the, the sad part of it is our kids would still be suffering. Right. I think this, this microphone or this exposure is really good for our future. Let me just say this. I think Baltimore has some of the brightest talent, uh, some of the, the, the greatest um, musical minds, engineering minds uh, that the world, you have, that, that, we, that we can offer for the world. I know some of these kids that come from Baltimore City. I know some that, that even dropped out now that are doing incredible, amazing things. And they talk about how the, the school system failed. Them. But... If, if, we, if this wasn't happening right now, uh, things would only get worse. Things would only get worse. So I'm glad, you know, that we're taking the first step of speaking up, speaking out, um, and making things happen. You said things would only get worse. Do you think without Project Baltimore, the public would even know it was happening? The public would know, but not know how to uh, truly express it. Right. We can we can talk amongst uh, our family members. We can talk amongst uh, people within our community. But unless a, 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 a grandiose movement is started, which is happening right now, um, you know, I, I want to shout out people empowered by the struggle that are really trying to, you know, make, make this thing happen. Um, like with that, with that, without that exposure, I, 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 you know, I just I just don't know. Mr. Vignaraja, education crime linked, we've talked about it, we know this is a thing. Is, it's naive to think that the two issues really aren't related, yet the connection doesn't seem like it's really been made by the leaders of the city. Why do you think that is? You know, their job is to pretend like these problems are not their responsibility. I've heard them say the school board is a state agency, so the schools are not their responsibility. The police department is a state agency, so crime is not their responsibility. I don't actually know what the mayor thinks is his responsibility is, besides going to flag football games. I really genuinely don't understand. Cutting ribbon. In 1855, Frederick Douglass said, it is easier to raise strong children than to repair broken men. It is as true today as it was five years before the American Civil War. And we, and we just ignore it. And, and Mackenzie, if I can just say one more thing about Project Baltimore, because they have in so many ways confirmed what all of us knew. The city has violated the public information laws by hiding information that the public deserves to know. 
the city has violated the rights of employees by silencing them and telling them to shut up or get fired. The city has violated the rights of the children by allowing them to go to schools where there's no heat or air conditioning or water in the water fountains and allowing them to have the lowest SAT scores in the state and some of the lowest grades in the country. They have failed to do everything that is part of their job, and we have allowed them to do it. This is what's got to end. It's got to end now. Let me ask you this. If we in improved literacy rates, performance inside the classroom, do you think we would still have the bloodshed that we're seeing across this, the city and these neighborhoods right now? Uh, of course not. If every one of these kids got the education that they deserve, they could be the next Thurgood Marshall. They could be the next Ben Carson. They could be engineers and lawyers and doctors and do whatever their dreams uh, fulfill them. My mom and dad taught in these schools. They saw the promise of these children. But if you don't have water that you can drink, air that you can breathe, if you've got the lowest SAT scores and people are passing you to the next grade and giving you diplomas when you don't even show up for school, what do you expect them to turn to? They have no skills. They can't read. They've got to go to the gangs and the streets because the other options aren't available to them. Mr. Well, Wallace, you, you come from a business background. Yeah. Would you agree that if we increased, obviously, the educational performance levels and opportunities, that the business opportunities would also open up and therefore help people in Baltimore? If we, if we had an education system that, that would take our babies in educate them so they didn't leak out of the system. They got through the system and they had skills on the back end. Now these skills don't necessarily have to be just college. There are other jobs in, 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 in plumbing and carpentry, electricity. You ever hire a plumber and see what their hourly rate is? It's incredible. So, so the, the idea is to give them skills that are marketable that they can find jobs in the economy. I have said from day one, the issue in Baltimore is an economic issue. Until we fix the economic issue in Baltimore City, all the other issues that we're facing will not go away. The African-American community has, has been, there's been disinvestment in that community for decades in Baltimore City. I remember uh, being raised in Cherry Hill, the, the racism and the class system that we had to deal with in the 60s and 70s. But here's the thing, parents, here's the things. Here's the thing, our parents from the 60s and 70s, although they faced unbelievable racism in the city, they were able to raise their children and get them and, and hold the public system accountable. We have, the same, we have to have the same kind of commitment today with our babies. We are responsible for their education, and we cannot use racism as an excuse or poverty as an excuse, right? We, we have to own it, and when we own it, we have the power to change it. Uh, I do want to add there... Um, because there has to be the character that's restored within our communities as well. Absolutely. Um, and one thing I want to note is that what is the example of character being shown by leadership all around, right? If, if our, our, our kids aren't stupid, right? They see what's going on to them. They see what's happening to them. Right. If, when they see that you don't care about their education, why should they care right. about anything else that's happening around them? If they see uh, administrators stealing and, and essentially getting away with it. Wow. What, do, what, what are they going to do Amen. or take up? Or what, what patterns are they observing? Or observing? Kids are very observant. I noticed that with my son. He does everything I do. Right? Yes. So um, our kids aren't stupid. So we have to develop that character. And what character is our right. administration showing? What character is our, is our community showing? And now when, we, when that's healed, we can demand whatever we need and, and heal our communities. Pastor Wright, I want to bring you education. There's a lot of blaming and finger pointing that goes around with education, but it's also happening when we talk about crime, and especially with leaders in City Hall. I've asked Mayor Brennan Scott about it and other leaders about what is really going on about crime. And the answer that I hear a lot is that it's somebody else's problem. Somebody else needs to step up, whether that's state agencies or federal agencies. What do you think it will take to step up from these? What do we need to see from these leaders? A leader that grows a backbone and isn't afraid to stand up and speak up. When you are in leadership, I'm going to break it down to a real simple level. When you're at home, when you're a family, mom and dad and kids, okay? I'm going to keep it just basic. When your child does something, you don't wait and say, okay, well, we're going to wait till they decide to jump off the roof to discipline them. 
When the problem starts, Amen. you start the solution. That's right. You don't wait till the problem gets out of hand. That's right. So when you see something, say something. Now, the culture that we have in this city of seeing something and stepping over it, got to stop. The culture that we have in this city about <laughs> quality of life crimes no longer being prosecuted and persecuted. So here's the thing. It starts small and it grows big. If you don't handle it when it's small, you're going to have to run from it when it's big. And that's where we are in the city. A mayor is the one that leads the city. So everything that happens in the city is his responsibility. That's correct. Now, the Bible says what you do to the least of us, you do to me. It also says teach a child in the way they should go, that they should go. So when they grow up, they do not depart. We failing on that. And everybody in this room knows it. That's why you're here, not at home. But the problem is we have to get everybody to put away that spirit of fear and stand up for their children, stand up for their city. Now, you asked specifically about crime. You want to fix crime? Brandon Scott does not need to go to Annapolis or D.C. saying, please, sir, may I have some more, and begging for money that he clearly doesn't know how to spend. What needs to happen is... One, you fix education. Two, you fix the food deserts. Three, you start to create a natural climate for the city itself to grow as opposed to wither. When people look, when you decide where you're going to buy your house, do you say, let me find the worst school district around? <laughs> do you say, let me go somewhere where the crime rate is sky high? You want to make sure when you buy a house that your real estate values go up, not down. So you're going to look at school system. You're going to look at the opportunity to find food to put on the table and see what kind of economic opportunities are there. If you don't fix the schools, you don't fix the food deserts, crime will not be fixed. And everybody in this room, please stop calling it, buying into the smoke and mirrors and calling it public safety. Because safe means safe. Public means the public is safe. And we ain't. So let's stop giving them the ability to smoke and mirror us again. I think the Go other ahead. piece to add to what, to what Pastor said it, it, it is the lack of critical thinking and the lack of technical skills that our leadership has. So when there's a problem that, 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 is, that exists, a, a critical thinking leader will come up with solutions that will solve that particular problem. We have leaders who, don't, who, have, who lack critical thinking. They can't think beyond the immediate need of that, of that particular issue. That's why somebody who has engineering experience, business experience, raising kids, those kinds of people will have enough data to make good decisions on how to solve problems. We need problem solver leaders. Thank you. Let's bring back in Riel Crane. I see you over there talking with some people who have some questions from the audience. Riel, let's take some more of those questions right now. Okay. I'm with uh, Sharia. Remind me of your last name, Sharia. Jennings. Sharia Jennings. And she had a question that was more related to accountability, but not so much elected officials. This is about the parents. Yes. Um, we as a community... Um, we have to take more accountability as parents to make sure that we hold our own selves accountable for our children. This is not an issue that one person can fix or a political group, a very small political group can fix. This is something that as a community, this is a us problem. This is something that we need to do together. Where are the parents? So when we're talking about children not going to school or getting passed through, where are the parents? Um, we're talking about minors, so they're not raising themselves. They have, to be, they have to be under the leadership of their household because leadership starts in the house. Did you want to direct that to one of the panelists about how you get parents more involved? Well, I think that um, more so focus in putting less emphasis on what the mayor is not doing or what the politicians aren't doing and coming up with solutions to help build the community so that we can actually work together because it's, it takes a village to raise a child and it starts with the family. Shannon Wright. You, you are absolutely correct. So here's the thing. The leadership is supposed to lead the city and the parents are supposed to lead their household. When you are in a situation where you see that the parents are having some struggles with that, 
and the leadership is having struggles, that's not going to work. So one of the first things, solution-based things that needs to happen is that all of the schools that are being redone all need to be done in a community format so that you invite parents in, so that you have workshops, seminars, classes, resources for the parents to be able to get them to understand how to parent in some cases. We got folks out here that were raised by the streets that are raising kids that nobody taught them how to do that. So if we really want to fix these things, yes, the family and the leadership. And, and one of the ways of being able to do that, again, is creating a community school format. The Bible says, as a man or woman think of in their heart, so are they. We have to change what our children see. If you want them to, to be successful, you have to show them success. I remember when I went from Cherry Hill to Polytech High School, from all black environment, uh, low income community, to a middle class environment where there were kids from middle class and, 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 and who, who were from successful families. And what I saw there made an impression on me in my, in my mind that that's what I want. I went to visit one of my friends who, uh, at Poly for, for the weekend, and he lived in Rowan Park, Victorian house, wraparound porch, the whole thing. What I saw, when I saw how he lived compared to how we lived in Cherry Hill, I was like, I want that. I want what he has. So I talked to his dad. He said, Mr. Tell me, what do you do? He said, Bob, I'm an engineer. I said, checkpoint. And he said, I said, how do you make money to live like this? He said, I own my own business. Checkpoint. That's why Bob Wallace today is an engineer and owns his own business. Because that man planted that seed years ago that I followed. Okay, we have a question from Charles Armstrong. Your question is related to what are the outstanding schools doing differently? Right. There have to be some outstanding schools in Baltimore. What are they doing that the other schools are not doing? The second question is, has anybody ever asked the students what they think of their schools and school system? I've never seen any survey of that type. The district says that it actually surveys the students to see what they think. In their reimagined plan for reopening the district, according to the words they put on paper, they did exactly that and asked the students what they thought of the schools. It didn't say anything good. I've, I've never, I've never seen the results of that kind of a survey, nor I've, have I heard about it. They, well, see, they, the survey didn't come out in their favor, so I would imagine that's why they haven't publicized it. But uh, if you Channel go to their 45, site, you can find it. There's a good job for you. Ask the students what they think about the schools. That's a good idea. So to answer, and, to your, that's uh, a good idea. To answer your other question, like what are the other schools doing different, um, I think it's the, the complete civic responsibility. That's why, again, I gave out that, that sheet which shows where the people lie, right? We... We have to be involved again, and it goes back to, um, you know, the families, right? We, our families have to be involved within the, the, the school system process. Um, my wife was a former uh, Baltimore City school teacher, and one, I remember one, she, she came home one day, and one morning she told me about, um, she called a, a student's parent one morning and telling, hey, your, your, your child isn't doing well in school. You know, her grades aren't, aren't, aren't up to par. Uh, you know, what can we do to help? Like, what, what's going on? Is there anything we can do? Do you know this, this child's mother cussed my wife out? Cussed her out for addressing the issues with, with her child, saying that she's your responsibility. I sent her to school. She's your responsibility. So there's aspects of the culture that do have to change in order for this entire thing to work. Right. If we let the air, if, if one tire is flat on your car, you don't let the air out the other ones right. and, and, and expect it to function. You have to repair, you know, the en entire thing for for the car to operate properly. So we, we have to go back to addressing the families as well. Um, and oftentimes the schools only have one parent to contact. That's right. So we have to, you know, involve the entire family and find out what's going on, um, you know, wh where fathers are, where mothers are, all these type of things. So if, if there's the ability to hold the entire system accountable, we have to do that. Also, um, a few years back, the way 
um, funding and the way that the resources were allocated to the buildings changed. So there is no uniformity now. Each building uh, gets a set amount of money, and they are entitled under that principle and those administrators in each building to decide how they want to do what they're supposed to be doing. So the, the, the most accurate answer to that question would be, Look at the stats from the State Board of Education site, see what schools are performing well, and literally ask them what they're doing differently. If you talk to parents that have children in multiple schools, they will tell you each of those schools could be like night and day. There is no uniformity, and that's part of the problem. Pastor Wright, thank you. I want to, we, our time is winding down. I want to get in as many questions as possible. Mr. Vignaraja, we've spoken with former elected leaders and city employees who are scared to talk about what they've seen take place in city government on a day-to-day -day basis. How can Baltimore ever improve if whistleblowers and other people who are inside are silenced and fear retribution or retaliation? This is the most dangerous thing that government can do to try to silence whistleblowers. If people don't see their public officials out in public, and the people who know this information in private are told, if you speak up, you'll lose your job, we're in trouble. You've got to have people agitating the system, both from the outside as well as from the inside. You wouldn't know about the performance falling at Augusta Fells. You wouldn't know that there are certain schools that have teachers that are not showing up, that have students that are not showing up. You've got to have, in any institution, in a business, in a school, uh, in a, a hospital, you've got to have people that are willing to come forward and not afraid that there will be repercussions and retaliation against them and their family. You know what that is? That's the mob. That's a gang. That's what gangs and mobs do to control their organization. That is shameful that that's what we're seeing in our city school system and in our city government. And those are thugs. Those are the real thugs. Mr. Wallace, we've seen mounting support for term limits and recalls and this, the citizens' ability to recall. We've talked about this. But what about term limits on elected officials? Do you support that idea? I do support term limits. There's no reason someone should become a career politician. The system was never designed to have, to have career politicians. We, we should find men and women that get in for two terms, no more than two terms, add their value, and then move on with their life. The problem we have is that our politicians are career politicians. And once you have career politicians, there's no creativity, no innovation, no impetus to solve problems. So yes, I do, term limits. Mr. Patterson, do you agree? Absolutely, I mean, one thing that you hear um, a lot of these career politicians say is that, oh, well, you guys don't know how government works. Right. You have to understand how government works. And you see, you see, that's how people get sucked in to this constant cycle, this, this, this systemic oppression that is Baltimore city government. Um, so term limits, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for all of our audience members. I apologize time constraints and getting in as many questions as possible. Again, thank you to our panelists for coming. Their insightful conversation and observations on this evening. And a huge thank you to the neighbors who came out to make sure that their voices were heard. We want to close tonight with a quote from the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. He said the care of human life and happiness and not their destruction is the first and only object of good government. This is a city in crisis and in need of good leadership and solving problems across the city. We just heard from the citizens, and it's time elected leaders join this conversation tonight, and as we hope that we see them the next time on our next stop of Our Voice, Your Future, Save Our City Town Hall Tour. Thanks again for coming, and have a great evening. I'm Dan Miller. I'm Kevin Stern. At Miller Stern Lawyers, we are honored to serve the community that we love. We work for you. For over a decade, we've spent our days and nights fighting for you. We believe in justice. We believe in fighting for what's right. That's why we are proud to sponsor a community conversation to make a better Baltimore. It takes guts to stand up 
for justice and accountability and demand better. And we can do it by giving you a voice in your future. At Miller Stern, we're fighting for a better Baltimore.